Now, an important and revealing moment in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was his first miracle. His first miracle. Just a quick recap. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were invited to a wedding party in Cana of Galilee. And when there was a shortage of wine, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. I'm sure we all remember the story. And Jesus said to her, woman, what do you desire to have me do? My time has not yet come. Then his mother said to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. This and that is still, that is still a good advice for each and every one of us today. Whatever Jesus is telling you to do, you should do it properly. Amen. Uh, later, Jesus tells the servants to fill six large stones, the vessel used by the Jew, or the Jewish used by, used for Jewish purification process with water. Then, Jesus asked the servants to throw some of the water in the vessels and give it to the master of the priest, who is the person responsible for overseeing the festivities. The master of the priest, after drinking what was handed to him, is astonished and amazed. He exclaimed to the bridegroom, every man serves the good wine first, and when the guests have drunk freely, then serves the inferior wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, by this sign, miraculous sign of wonder, by this, this miraculous sign of wonder, uh, Jesus revealed his glory as the Son of God to his disciples. Amazed, his disciples put their faith, the Bible records that the disciples, the disciples put their faith in him. That is to say, their faith in him increased. May our faith in Jesus increase this season as we behold his love and compassion for us as Lord, as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now you may be wondering what is the significance of Jesus' first miracle at Christmas? What is the significance of Christ's first miracle at Christmas? Now, the first miracle was shadows his ministry, that is, what he came to do on earth, and also revealed his identity. Our first Corinthians 15, 45 to 47, first Corinthians 15, 45 to 47. So it is written in scripture. The first man, Adam, became a living soul, an individual. The last Adam Christ became a life giving spirit, restoring the dead, the dead life. However, the spiritual, the emotional life is not first, but the physical, the emotional life, then the spiritual. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthy, made of dust. The second man, Christ the Lord, is from heaven. Now, we all know the story in Genesis. The first Adam failed, and therefore sin and death and the devil ruled the earth. God, in his infinite mercy, sent the Son clothed in human flesh to dwell among us. Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness, in the, in the likeness of men. For God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, as the second Adam, just Jesus, Jesus came to rescue mankind from sin and death, and to reveal the love and compassion of God, the Father. In a nutshell, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. The thief, the Bible says, the thief, which is the devil, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus came that we may have life, that we may have it more abundantly. 
In the first miracle that we just read about, uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, was the catalyst for the miracle. She knew they are running out of wine, and this wedding was the work of the devil, because running out of wine will ruin the wedding day of a young couple, and so she had to intervene. Now the glory of God was displayed, and that led the apostles as to let to put their trust in Jesus. May we continue to put our trust in Jesus, Emmanuel God with us. Amen. Now, in that sense, in essence, Christmas celebrates Jesus as the man of God made flesh dwelling among us and remaining with us even up to so now. Christmas also celebrates Jesus as our treasure. Therefore, we are refusing to hold the treasures of this world dearer than Jesus. Finally, Jesus celebrates, I mean, Christmas celebrates Jesus as our victory. He broke sin's power over us and saved a, piece of, a, a people and saved a people, a people for himself. Now, the identity and the ministry of Christ are what Christmas is all about. The identity and the ministry of Christ is what Christmas is all about. This truth will reveal this was very close before this ministry actually, or public ministry actually started. Now, the miracle of turning water to wine was a miracle of blessing, abundance, and transformation. Shame was done to fame for a young couple in the community. Jesus transformed something ordinary into something extraordinary, just as he does with each and every one of us when he touches our lives and transforms us into new creations. We are turned from water into wine. The old passes away and the new comes. However, this transformation is not the one we done to, but rather a lifetime process of becoming. Christmas is the time of year when we try to show one another the best side of ourselves. The question is, why can't we show the best side of ourselves every day? Every day should be like Christmas. The time of rejoicing in the Lord, the time of renewal, and the reminder of the need, need, the need for personal transformation from something ordinary to something extraordinary. The old is passing away and the new is coming into life. Anyway, I'm going to repeat it to our people that we all say this time of year. Jesus is about, I mean, Christmas is all about Jesus. <laughs> Christmas is all about Jesus. The world became flesh and blood and uh, moved into our neighborhood. Jesus came from heaven to earth. Now, if we invite him, just like he was invited to that wedding, if we invite him into our lives, then we can experience the blessings of Jesus Christ in our life. So God with us every day, in uh, every day and each day. And that will be our portion in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah. Now, rightfully so, the Christmas time is also about remembering the crown of Christ as God in human flesh, the incarnation of Christ. For there are other people in the story the other people in the story. And one of the things I want to point out today is spend some time today to look at two people who are very instrumental in bringing about Jesus Christ. And that is Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary. We need to see Christmas from a personal viewpoint in order to keep our faith strong like the apostle when he saw the miracle and believed in Jesus. Our God is a God of relationship, not in the world. And now, just to be clear, just to be clear, like everything else, the devil is always trying to change something good to something evil. Now, Jesus has been parents who are his stepfather, Joseph, and his mother, Mary. However, Jesus is God who has always existed. So, he didn't may have parents who brought it into existence. I just want to make that clear. Okay, 
Uh, evil Mary uh, is just a vessel through whom Jesus came to us on earth in fully human form. So Joseph again experienced the manner that he has first and at the very first Christmas. It is true that some make an idol out of Mary, he said, the mother of the mother of the incarnate son of God. It is also true that um, there's a lot of dogmas surrounding Mary these days. Okay. Some people say that she was a perpetual, she had perpetual virginity. Okay. Some people say that uh, she had immaculate conception. Okay. In which case, she herself was born without any sin. Okay. That is not true. Others believe that uh, it the assumption of it, in which case that she ascended into heaven just like Jesus. Now, none of this, we, we don't read about any of this in the Bible, so be careful what you read about Mary and don't make Mary into the God. As for Joseph, he seems to be a forgotten man at Christmas time. Now, we think about the virgin, the mother, and the child of an angel in the realms of glory, and the shepherds in the fields, founded, and about the time, the town, the town in Bethlehem, and about the kings from the Orient, but not much is said about Joseph. Now, in actual fact, if you look at your Bible, you wouldn't see any sentence that Joseph said in the Bible. So it was basically uh, not very well known, or not much is said about him in the Bible. The last mention of Joseph was when Jesus was 12 years old, and he stayed behind at the temple at Jerusalem. But one thing we can be sure was the fact that uh, God uh, examined the character of Joseph and made sure that that's the person he wanted to use as the, as the uh, foster father of Jesus. And God definitely supervised the choice of the Lord's hand for Mary. So as we read it through the story of Mary and Joseph, I would like everyone to encourage you you put yourself in the shoes. Put yourself in the shoes. See if you can do what they did. Okay. Put yourself because that would that would give you a different perspective when we talk about Joseph and Mary. And that would also help to make the story come alive for you and I. I am going to read uh, Luke uh, chapter one twenty six to thirty nine. To see the birth of Jesus from the viewpoint of Mary. The birth of Jesus from the viewpoint of Mary. And, uh, now, uh, in, the, in the sixth month uh, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, take what you have. The Lord is with you. For being on the stealth, Mary tried to think for the angel to leave. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for your father will be God. You will conceive and give birth to the son, and you name him Jesus. He will be very great and be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now Mary asked the angel, how can this happen at the virgin? And the angel replied, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit will come up and do in the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the baby will be born, ready to be born with the Holy and will be called the Son of God. But mom, the relative, the river, and the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, her whole age, people used to say she was barren, and she has conceived the Son, uh, and it's now in the sixth month. But the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. A few days later, Mary appointed the full control of the year to the town where Zechariah lived. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. And in those days, the man is very young. In which case, she was no more than 16 years or even less than that. 
Alright, so uh, now of course uh, she knowing that you know having everything so she has been uh, she has been uh, raised by Joseph, okay? And life was going according to plan. A lot will remember you know that life expectancy was less than four years old. Okay, all that factors to the way they get married. So all of a sudden the angel shows up and say, Okay, now you're gonna have a baby. <laughs> now if you were if you were Mary, what would you do? Know? Yes, you know, if you put yourself in the shoe of Mary, you put yourself in the shoe of Joseph and see if you can deal with what the devil did. Okay. So now somebody now said, Okay, now you go you going to you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a baby and the baby will be the son of God. Of course, when you, when you hear that, you may be thinking, well, uh, well that's not good, but also remember, it's a totally different society. How is she going to cope in a society where it's impossible for a virgin to have a baby? <laughs> so how, how could she explain herself? Look at all the things that she has to walk through, right? Okay. And, and chances are, we should probably Kicked out of the family, chances that she become a social, a social outcast, and she actually could be stoned to death. Okay. So, those are the things that she has to deal with now. If it's you, what would you do? Are you going to tell God, why are you make my life difficult? That's really what we say, right? Why me, right? Okay. Why, why, why are you make my life difficult all of a sudden? What did I do wrong? Okay. Now, um, uh, of course, a few days later, of course, uh, he went to visit uh, Elizabeth, who was who is now uh, pregnant, and she ended up spending three months with uh, with her. Now, let's look at the viewpoint of the birth of Jesus from the from uh, um, the, the the birth of Jesus from the viewpoint of Joseph. So Joseph was already. Uh, and I'm going to read Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Uh, this is how, uh, Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was the righteous man, and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to bring the engagement quietly. As he considered, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the dream. Joseph, from the David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as a wife. For the child, uh, within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you will, you have to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give us the son, and will call him the mother, which means God in us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but did not have sexual relations with the child until the son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Okay, now let's look at it. If you are Joseph, and the an angel appears to you in the room and says, no, Wife to be is now pregnant. What well, what were you gonna say? What would you do? Are you gonna believe the idea? Are you gonna believe the dream? Are you gonna say I'm going to smoke this up to that? These are the these are the realities that they, they have they had to go through. They, they had to go through, of course. And then of course right after that, and I'm guessing even that the Bible didn't say it, I'm guessing before maybe left. To go visit Elizabeth, the must have turned out to um, Joseph to say, Hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. Now, if it's you, right, your wife. <laughs> now, at that particular time, of course, uh, the angel has not appeared to Joseph. So, Mary comes to you and say, Hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. I'm, I, I, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. What would you say? If you were Joseph, what would you say? What do you think I am, right? Okay. I'm called some kind of a fool. Okay. All right. Okay. So, but, but let's put ourselves 
in their shoes to be able to see that what they went through, even though when we're living today, they say they're very lucky as our children. But let's remember, these are not easy things. Uh, what the reason why I'm, the reason why I'm saying is the fact that sometimes we also go through life, and we really don't fully understand what is going on. But are we going to trust God, or are we going to say, "I'm going to do my own stuff because I don't understand it. I don't know what I what I what I know about." Okay. Because every step of the way in, in the life of these two people, they, they had to make decisions to trust God rather than rely on their own understanding. Now, also understand that this is not this is not the bed of roses either. That it's not like well, when they said, okay, yes to God, the million dollars fell up from the sky. Right? They still have to walk through their daily lives in the society whereby. Probably people are laughing at it and just want to say, look at that too. Like, why is he marrying somebody that's already pregnant? Right. Or people are going to be saying something behind me and say, yeah, well, you must, uh, you, you think we are all fools, okay? Uh, all this way, yes, all this way. We, we know better, right? Mm-hmm. But, but these are the, the reality that they had to face. And I'm sure that, I mean, when we all signed up to the Christian right? We didn't sign up to go to persecution. We all, we all felt that, yeah, I'm going to be serving God. Everything should be on glory, that everything should be preached. But that's not the reality that we see in the life of Mary and Jesus. But they persevered. They persevered. And a couple of things I want to point out about their life that may help us on the, on the today. The first thing, of course, is the fact that fear doesn't dictate your faith. Fear does not dictate your faith. Remember the first thing that the uh, the angel said to Mary is what? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Okay. Which is the same message for each and every one of us today. Whatever it is that we're going through as a result of the fact that we are Christians, God is still saying, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Okay. I got your back. So that's one thing that we need to uh, be aware of that the, no matter what it is, the circumstances that we're going through, we shouldn't let fear or the fear of man or the fear of whatever dictate exactly how we're going to react to the opportunity that God is presenting to, 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 to us. So fear does, doesn't have to control us. Instead, we should focus on Jesus and the outcome that Jesus has planned for each and every one of us. The second thing I want to point out is the fact that follow God's plan, not your own plan. Follow God's plan, not your own plan. Now we know that uh, the, the plan of Joseph and Mary were not to go through all these hardships because of Jesus. But when they were presented with that opportunity to be a foster parent for the Son of God, they embraced it, even though they know that it's not going to be easy. Enough. So don't be, don't, don't take the same plan because yeah, it's less stressful, but if that's not what God wants for you, that's the point of the uh, What God wants for each and every one of us is to be like Jesus, ultimately. But that is not something that is going to happen easily. That's the point, all the people that want to make. That every plan of God to transform us is not something that is going to be easy. And that's the reason why the psalmist to encourage us say that I have been young and I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Okay. So we need to have that trust that God knows the reason why we are going through whatever it is that we are going through. Now, number three, you can trust God even when it doesn't make any sense. Most of what God is going to do will not make any sense. <laughs> okay? It may not make any sense from our own perspective. It may not make any sense. Like I said, the fact that they were going to be uh, foster parents for Jesus doesn't mean that everything was going to be easy. They didn't get a million dollars the next day. 
even if you remember when they took Jesus to the um, what the ceremony that the the Jews the, the Jews when they gave him about eight years old. They couldn't afford the ram, they couldn't afford it. The only thing they could afford is the turkey dog, or dog, okay. Which is the, the least, okay, of what is required. The point I'm trying to make is the fact that serving God or going to class life may not make sense, may not be easy, but let's understand the push past the struggles that we're going through because we know God is going to make everything right. Again, it's easier said than done, but based on what we know, God has been faithful and we can count on the fact that we can continue to be faithful. A couple of other things I want to point out about Mary, that she was saturated with scriptures. She was saturated with scriptures. If you look at what the song that she wrote, which is in Luke uh, 1, chapter 1, 46 to 55, Okay, and I'm just going to read 46 to 50. They said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoice in God, my Savior. For he has regarded this lowly state of his late servant, for behold, henceforth all generations will come in bless. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and for you in his name. And his mercy, his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. In actual fact, if you read the entire, entire, uh, what she wrote, uh, she was quoting from the book of Psalms, the book of Samuel, the book of Micah, the book of Exodus. So definitely she knows that stuff, right? And how many of us can say that today? Okay. So, <laughs> So anyway, she 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 knows the scripture, so we're all ought to be encouraged to know more about the word of God so that we can really stand in our faith. The other thing of course that really did was to test she, she kept secrets. She wasn't wanting the man to say, See my son, he's the son of God. <laughs> she didn't do that, right? <laughs> now, I mean most most of us most of us of course were to very, very it be very difficult for most, if some of us keep our mouth shut. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, my son, ah, my son, the son of God. Who, who was your son? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, the, the Bible said we should be slow to speak, right? Uh, and in other case, uh, the Bible said, uh, study to be quiet. And in other case, we said we should, we, we, we said that in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. So the point is, the point I'm making is the fact that she had the grace be able to control her mouth and she just kept the secrets to herself without broadcasting it to say, hey, I am the mother of the Son of God. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, the other thing about Joseph was the fact that uh, Joseph was a good citizen. When they said, go and, go and, uh, the census came, right? The census came and they said, go back to your village or whatever and go register yourself. And of course, Joseph, being an obedient citizen, went back and did according to what the, the authorities at that particular time said. So in essence, what I'm trying to say is the fact that we also need to obey the laws as long as it's not against the teachings of the Bible. We need to be obedient to the laws of the land as long as it's not against the commands of the Bible. So, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, the story of Mary and Joseph is an incredible display of faith, trust, and what that can do to ordinary people that do a life. Okay? Uh, it doesn't, God is not going to choose you because you got it, because you got it together. God is going to show, choose you, or God has chosen each and every one of us because of you. The end from the beginning, he knows our heart. And he, he knows that we can do it. That's the reason why it's called you and I to be Christians today. And by grace and combined with our trust, we can accomplish more than what we could ever imagine. The other one I also want to make is the fact that the importance of revelation, the importance of revelation, uh, because it is your level of revelation that is going to determine how you suffer. 
Okay. It is your level of revelation that is going to determine how you serve God. What do I mean by that? Okay. Uh, Mary was visited by an angel, right? So she had a revelation about what is going on. And that's the reason why she was able to say, I'm willing to do this, right? The same thing with Joseph. Joseph initially did not fully believe what Mary was saying until Joseph had a revelation through a dream to say, hey, this is your, the, the, the son that your uh, wife to be is carrying is the son of God. Okay. So what I'm trying to make is the fact that we all need a revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. For us to actually be able to serve God, serve, Jesus, serve God the way we're supposed to. Let, let me explain to you. If, if somebody told you about Jesus uh, based on their own experience, that would carry you for a while. But ultimately, you also have to know Jesus for yourself. Right? It is that one, it is when you know Jesus for yourself that is going to affect your relationship with God. Okay. Once you get to that particular point, anybody can talk to you out of being a Christian. But once you actually have that revelation yourself, that you reveal to you yourself, then nobody can talk to you out of it. Just give me an example of what I'm trying to say. If you remember the story of uh, the story of uh, Jesus and his disciples, I remember was asking them, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And until um, Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Okay. That the Messiah, the son of the living God. Of course, Jesus said, well, uh, God revealed that to you. That's what I'm talking about. That revelation to say you actually know for sure that what you know is what you know and is the truth. Nobody can talk you out of it. We all need to get to that level because when you get to that particular level, your mind, your your attitude, everything about you is going to change. And just back on what I'm trying to say is the fact that also remember it is after Peter revealed the true identity of Christ that Christ now began to tell them that okay, I am going to go to Jerusalem. I am going to die, and I am going to raise up in three days. In which case, it's key for every Christian to know Jesus for who Jesus is really is. Okay, not just the prophet, not just the teacher, but the Son of God. So once you have that understanding within yourself, especially during this time of year that we talk about uh, the baby, the manger. The, the king from the east or whatever. Do we really know Jesus is the question. Do you really know who Jesus is? Have you really met that Jesus that we are talking about? Do you have a revelation about who Jesus is? Because it's only when we have that revelation that, that, that becomes the turning point in, in our life. Okay? Just like Mary had the revelation just like Joseph had the revelation, we also have to have a revelation about what who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. Until we get to that particular level, it's going to be very difficult for somebody not to talk out of being mm-hmm. a Christian. Or to be to be able to stand when things are very, 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 very difficult. That's what I'm trying to say. Because again, this is not it's not going to be a bed of roses. To be a Christian. I mean, right now we know that the parts of the world where we are Christians are being persecuted every day. And the only reason why you'll be able to stand the persecution is if you know and you know and you know for sure that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay. And that is the reason why it's very important for us, just like for Mary, just like for Joseph, to really know what who Jesus is, okay? And to get to the point, just like, uh, just like Mary said, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. 
And that's what I want to close with today, right? To say that, I mean, are we ready to trust and obey Jesus? Wholeheartedly, no doubt about it. Because the Bible says, just as we were born of the image of the earthly, the man of God, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, the man of heaven. And that's where God wants to take us. To be the, to bear the image of Christ, not the image of the man of dust, but the image of the man from heaven. And that's the challenge for each and every one of us today, to reflect during this period, they were to reflect on God's loving character that was able to care for each and every one of us. He sent his only begotten son to us to come and take our place and give us the opportunity to be something extraordinary. Because God wants each and every one of us to be that church. Okay, so I am going to encourage every one of us to reflect and what has God, God has done for you this year, God has taken us from January to December, and I'm sure we went through quite a few things this year. But with that experience in mind, just take some time as we go into now, pray, uh, take some time to reflect on that, pray, and praise God for what He's done for you.